The Unique and Its Property by Max Stirner I have based my affair on nothing. What is not supposed to be my affair? Above all, the good cause. Then God's cause, the cause of humanity, of truth, of freedom, of humaneness, of justice. Furthermore, the cause of my people, my prince and my fatherland. Finally, even the cause of mind and a thousand other causes. Only my own cause is never supposed to be my affair. Down with the egoist who thinks only of himself. Let's see how they deal with their cause. Those for whose causes we are supposed to work, sacrifice ourselves, and be filled with enthusiasm. You are able to report thoroughly on God, since you have investigated the depths of divinity for thousands of years and have seen into its heart so that you can probably tell us how God himself deals with God's cause, which we are called to serve. Nor do you conceal the Lord's activities. Now, what is his cause? Does he make an alien cause, the cause of truth or love his own, as he expects us to? You are outraged at this misunderstanding, and you inform us that God's cause is indeed the cause of truth and love, but this cause cannot be called alien to him because God himself is truth and love. You are outraged at the assumption that God might resemble us poor worms by promoting an alien cause as his own. Quote, should God promote the cause of truth if he is not himself truth? End quote. He cares only for his own cause, but since he is all in all, therefore all is his affair. But we, we are not all in all and our affair is utterly small and contemptible, therefore we must serve a higher cause. Now it is clear. God cares only for what is his, deals only with himself, thinks only of himself, and looks out only for himself. Woe to all that is not well-pleasing to him. He serves nothing higher and satisfies only himself. His cause is a purely egoistic affair. How does it stand with humanity, whose cause we should make ours? Is its cause perhaps that of another, and does humanity serve a higher cause? No, humanity sees only itself. Humanity wants to promote only humanity. Humanity itself is its own cause, so that it develops. It lets people struggle away in its service, and when they have accomplished what humanity needs, it throws them on the dung heap of history in its gratitude. Isn't humanity's cause? a purely egoistic affair. I don't at all need to show that everything that tries to push its cause over on us is concerned only with itself, and not with us, only with its well-being, and not with ours. Just have a look for yourselves at the rest. Do truth, freedom, humaneness, and justice want anything else than that you get enthusiastic about them and serve them? They all do exceptionally well when they are zealously revered. Take a look at the nation, which is defended by devoted patriots. The patriots fall in bloody battle or in the fight against hunger and need. What does the nation say about that? With the manure of these corpses, the nation becomes a blossoming nation. Individuals have died for the great cause of the nation, and the nation sends some words of thanks after them, and profits from it. I would call this lucrative egoism. But just look at the sultan, who so lovingly cares for his own. Isn't he pure selflessness itself, and doesn't he sacrifice himself, hour after hour, for his own? Yes, of course, for his own. Try just once to show yourself not as his own, but as your own. For escaping his egoism, you will take a trip to his jail. The sultan has based his affair on nothing but himself. He is for himself the all in all and the only one and tolerates no one who dares not to be his own. And won't you learn from these shining examples that the egoist gets on best? I, for my part, take a lesson from them, and instead of serving these great egoists unselfishly anymore, I would rather prefer to be the egoist myself. God and humanity have based their affair on nothing. On nothing but themselves. I, likewise, base my affair on myself. This I, who just like God, am the nothing of all others. This I, who am my all. This I, who am the unique. If God, if humanity, as you affirm, have enough content in themselves to be all in all to themselves, 
and I feel that I would lack it even less, and that I would have no complaint to make about my emptiness. I am not nothing in the sense of emptiness, but am the creative nothing, the nothing out of which I myself create everything as creator. Away then with every cause that is not completely my affair. You think that at the least the good cause must be my affair? Which good, which bad? I am myself my own affair, and I am neither good nor bad. Neither makes any sense to me. The divine is God's affair, the human cause is humanity's. If my affair is neither the divine nor the human, it is not the good, the true, the just, the free, etc., but only my own, and it is not general, but it is unique, as I am unique. For me, there is nothing greater than me. Part 1. Humanity For the human being, the human being is the supreme being, Feuerbach says. The human being has just now been discovered, Bruno Bauer says. Well then, let's take a closer look at this supreme being and this new discovery. A Human Life from the moment that he sees the world's light, a human being tries to extract himself from its confusion, in which he too is tossed about along with everything else, and finds himself. But everything that comes in contact with the child also defends itself against these encroachments, and maintains its own existence. Consequently, since each one holds to itself, and at the same time continually comes into conclusion with others, the battle for self-assertion is unavoidable. Victory or defeat. The fortune of the battle wavers between the two alternatives. The victor becomes the lord, the defeated one the subject. The former exercises supremacy and the rights of supremacy, and the latter carries out the duties of the subject with awe and respect. But the two remain enemies and always lie in ambush. They lie in wait for each other's weaknesses, the child for those of her parents the parents for those of their child, example, fear. Either the stick vanquishes the human being, or the human being vanquishes the stick. In childhood, liberation takes the course wherein we try to find the reason for things, to get at what's behind things. Therefore, we spy out the weaknesses of all, for which, as everyone knows, children have a sure instinct. Therefore, we find pleasure in breaking things, in rummaging through hidden corners, prying into what is covered up or out of the way, and trying our hands at everything. Once we get at what's behind things, we know ourselves with confidence. When we discover, for example, that the rod is too weak against our defiance, we no longer fear it. We have outgrown it. Behind the rod, more powerful than it, stands our defiance, our defiant courage. We slowly get at what's behind everything that was weird and scary to us, behind the weirdly dreaded power of the rod, the father's stern look, etc. And behind all of it, we find our tranquility, i.e. imperturbability, fearlessness our counterforce, superior strength invincibility. Before the things that once inspired fear and respect in us, we no longer shyly withdraw, but take courage. Behind everything, we find our courage, our superiority. Behind the sharp command of parents and bosses, our courageous choice or our outwitting cunning still stand. And the more we feel ourselves, the smaller that which once seemed insurmountable appears. And what is our trickery, cunning, courage, and defiance? What else but mind? For quite some time, we have spared the conflict that leaves us so short of breath later, the fight against reason. The most beautiful childhood passes without requiring us to fight against reason. We pay it no mind at all, don't deal with it, accept no reason. We are convinced of nothing through persuasion and are deaf to good reason, principles, etc., but we find caresses, punishment, and the like hard to resist. This sharp life struggle with reason comes in later and begins a new phase. In childhood, we scamper about without too much reflection. Mind is the name of the first self-discovery, the first banishment of God from the divine, that is from the uncanny, the phantasms, and the powers above. Our fresh feeling of youth, this feeling of self, 
is no longer impressed by anything, the world is explained to its discredit because we are above it. We are mind. Only now do we see that we have not viewed the world mindfully at all. We've only stared at it. We exercise our first powers on natural forces. Parents impress us as a natural force, later we say. Father and mother are to be left behind, and all natural forces considered as broken. They are vanquished. For the rational, i.e. the intellectual human being, there is no family as a natural force, a refusal of parents and siblings, etc., appears. If these are born again as mental, rational forces, they are not at all what they were before. And a young person doesn't just vanquish parents, but human beings in general, they are no obstacle to him, and he doesn't take them into consideration. For now, he says, one must obey God rather than men. Footnote 1, a reference to Acts 5.29. Everything earthly steps back to a contemptible distance beneath this high standpoint, since this standpoint is the heavenly. Now the attitude has completely turned around. The youth takes up a mindful manner, whereas the boy, who did not yet sense himself as mind, grew up in mindless learning. The former does not try to grasp things, for example, to bring the data of history into his head, but rather the thoughts that lie hidden in things. Therefore, for example, the spirit of history. The boy, on the other hand, most likely understands connections, but not ideas. The spirit, and so he strings together whatever he can, without proceeding a priori, and theoretically, without searching for ideas. If in childhood one had to overcome the resistance of the laws of the world, now in everything one plans, he bumps into an objection of the mind, of reason, of his own conscience. Quote, that is unreasonable, unchristian, and unpatriotic, and so on. The conscious calls to us and frightens us away from it. We fear neither the power of the vengeful humanities, not Poseidon's wrath, not God, as far as he sees even the hidden, nor the father's punishing rod, but rather conscience. Footnote 2. Humanities literally means the kindly ones, but refers to the Erinyes or Furies of ancient Greek mythology, who are goddesses of vengeance. Now we dwell on our thoughts, and follow their orders just as earlier we followed parental and human ones. Our actions conform to our thoughts, ideas, conceptions, and beliefs, as in childhood they conform to the orders of our parents. However, we were also already thinking as children, and our thoughts were not fleshless. Abstract, absolute, i.e., nothing but thoughts. A heaven for itself, a pure world of thought. Logical thoughts. On the contrary, they had only been thoughts that we had about a thing. We thought about the thing in this way or that. Thus we may have thought, the world we see there was made by God. But we didn't think of, or investigate, the depths of divinity itself. We may have thought, this is true about this thing, but we didn't think about the true or truth itself, nor bring together in one sentence, God is truth. We did not touch the depths of divinity, which is truth. Pilate doesn't linger over logical, i.e. theological questions. What is truth? But has no hesitation. Therefore, in determining in the individual case, what is true in the thing, i.e., whether the thing is true. Every thought tied to a thing is not yet nothing but a thought, absolute thought. We bring pure thought to light, or to cling to it. This is the desire of youth and all the shining lights in the world of thought, like truth, freedom, humanity, the human being, etc., enlighten and inspire the youthful soul. But if the spirit is recognized as the essential thing, it still makes a difference whether the spirit is poor or rich, and therefore one tries to become rich in spirit. The spirit wants to spread out to found its empire, an empire not of this world, the world just vanquished. So then, it longs to be all in all itself. In other words, although I am spirit, I am not yet perfectly spirit, and must first strive for the perfect spirit. But with that, I, who had just found myself as spirit, immediately lose myself again, 
in that I bow before the perfect spirit not as my own, but as otherworldly, and feel my emptiness. Footnote 3. Jen Satigan in the original, referring to otherworldly. The word can be translated as opposite or other, but is generally used in theological contexts, this implying otherness in a specifically mystical sense. Indeed, spirit is essential for everything, but is every spirit also the right spirit? The right and true spirit is the ideal of the spirit, or the holy spirit. It is not my or your spirit, but simply an ideal. Otherworldly one, it is God. God is spirit. And this otherworldly Father in heaven gives to those who ask of him. Luke 11.13 the man is distinguished from the youth in that he takes the world as it is, instead of presuming that it is everywhere in the wrong, and wanting to improve it, to mould it to his ideal. In him, the view that one has to deal with the world according to his interest, and not his ideal, is established. As long as one knows himself only as spirit, and puts all his value in being spirit, it becomes a light thing for the youth to give his life his bodily life for nothing, for the silliest point of honour. For so long he also only has thoughts, ideas that he hopes to be able to realise once he has found a sphere of action, thus in the meantime one has only ideals, unfulfilled ideas or thoughts. Only when one grows fond of himself in the flesh, and enjoys himself just as he is, but it is in mature years, in the man, that we find this. Only then does one have a personal or egoistic interest, i.e. not only an interest of the spirit, for example, but rather total satisfaction, satisfaction of the whole fellow, a selfish interest. Just compare a man with a youth, and see if he doesn't seem harder, less noble, and more selfish. Is he therefore worse? No, you say, he has only become more certain, or as you call it, more practical. But the main thing is this, that he makes himself more the centre than does the youth who gets enthused by other things, for example, God, the fatherland, and so on. Therefore the man shows a second self-discovery. The youth found himself as spirit and lost himself again in the general spirit, the perfect, the holy spirit, human being and humanity, in short, every ideal. The man finds himself as embodied spirit. Boys had only non-intellectual interests, i.e. thoughtless and devoid of ideas. Youths had only intellectual interests. The man has bodily, personal, egoistic interests. If the child lacks an object to occupy itself with, it feels boredom, because it does not yet know how to occupy itself with itself. Conversely, the youth throws the object to the side, because for him, thoughts arose out of the object. He occupies himself with his thoughts, his dreams occupies himself intellectually, or his mind is occupied. The young person deals with everything non-intellectual under the contemptuous name of outward appearances. Footnote 5. The German word Ausschlichtkeiten can also mean trivialities or superficialities. If he nonetheless sticks to the pettiest outward appearances, for example, student club, customs, and other such formalities, it happens because and if he finds mind in them, i.e. if they are symbols to him. Footnote 6. A reference to often clandestine student clubs that appeared in Germany after the Napoleonic Wars, dedicated to national German unity and often also to more democratic institutions. As I find myself behind things, that is, as mind, so I must later also find myself behind thoughts, namely as their creator and owner. In the time of mind, thoughts grew in me until they were over my head. Though they were its offspring, they hovered about me and shook me like the fever dreams, a horrifying power. The thoughts had become embodied for themselves, were ghosts such as God, Emperor, Pope, and Fatherland, etc., if I destroy their embodiment, then I take them back into my own, and say, I alone am embodied, and now I take the world as what it is to me, as mine, as my property. I relate everything to myself.
If as spirit I push the world away in the deepest contempt, as owner, I push spirits and thoughts away in their vanity. They have no more power over me, as no earthly force has power over the spirit. The child was realistic, involved with the things of this world, until bit by bit he succeeded in getting at what was behind these very things. The youth was idealistic, enthused by thoughts, until he worked his way up to being the man, the egoistic one, who deals with things and thoughts according to his heart's desire, and places his personal interest above everything. Finally, the old man. When I become one, there'll be enough time to talk about that. On an unrelated note from Desert Outpost, Max Stirner died at age 49.